Well, they say life itself is a highway, and we all travel our own roads. Some good, some bad, yet each is a blessing of its own. Tonight's story will test that theory. It's once again time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, and listen. The empty road seemed to stretch for eternity. It was a monotonous path, a typical highway, but unsettlingly empty this particular night. Of course, for a man who had nothing left in his life, it didn't matter. Steve tried to keep himself from thinking about his life. He had been tired, a frustrated man with a respectable but boring job. He hated everything about his workplace. Commercial stuff was never meant for him. This was a man meant to achieve more than calling people on a regular basis and trying to interest them in the stock market, only to have himself abruptly hung up on, or much worse, having his time wasted. After around twelve mind-numbing hours, he came home to an empty apartment, occupied by fancy-looking cheap decor. His wife was always thinking about saving up, always so tight when it came to spending money. Jesus, Janie, you and I are enough. Come on, we can afford this, Steve said to his wife. It was an old memory now, a couple of years back. Steve had taken a liking to this particular sofa. It had the most comfortable seats and a delightful little bounce when she sat on it. It was a glorious shade of yellow, which also happened to be Janie's favorite color. At least her first favorite color. Yellow, red, green, and then purple, Steve chuckled as he remembered. Oh, come on, hon. There are tons of sofas out there like this. I bet we could save at least a few hundred bucks if we go somewhere else. The memory was so clear in his mind, he almost felt the words dance around him. Her thoughts made him smile. Oh, she was a sweet woman. She had her quirks, but she was sweet. That's why he'd loved her, and then eventually married her. But that was before. That was the Janie he loved. That Janie was long gone, and instead, there was someone else he shared his bed with now. It wasn't always like that, but things change. People change, and sometimes for the worse. At first, Steve had reasoned her irritability was due to her frequent night shifts at the hospital. She'd come home tired and sleep all day. They hardly talked then. It was a little hard at first, but Steve got used to it. As time progressed, Janie had started to act dull every day. She was always tired and frequently had bursts of anger, always directed towards him. Even for the smallest things that went wrong, she began to curse at him and curse their marriage. This was especially upsetting for Steve, and over time, he started to avoid any interactions with her. It was not out of anger or of his own will. He just, well, he just felt scared. He was afraid of making her angry, yet it seemed to be inevitable. Eventually, Steve had started to lash out too, Every offensive comment she made out of her anger, well, it angered Steve even worse. He began to yell at her, raising his voice like he hadn't in years, and that he'd never expected that he would ever have to again. The road seemed to stretch on forever, but he didn't care much. His thoughts kept him company. Those in the briefcase he carried with him. The music from the radio was low, just there to conceal the emptiness. Oh, he hated that feeling. It reminded him of the time Janie had started to completely avoid him. She seemed to be repulsed by his very being, not even looking over in his direction at times. Her vocabulary of colourful insults started to water down, and eventually it just consisted of... And okay. He didn't know what had gone wrong. Had he not been spending enough time with her? Had he not been gifting her enough? 
yes, maybe that was it. He should take her out to a nice dinner and buy her gifts. That would probably do something. It always seemed to work in the movies, and that's how their love had been. Movie love. At least before Janie changed. As Steve's red Camry made its way through the highway, he passed through a gas station. He kept on going. He didn't need gas, not for a while. And when he would, he'd find another. So right now, he had to just keep going. Par next to the gas station was a police car, inside which sat Officer Berg and his partner and his junior, Officer Floyd. They each had a cup of warm coffee, sipping on it between exchanging words. Berg had taken quite a liking to Floyd. The young man reminded him of himself in his own rookie days, lazy but a good learner. Maybe the reason she felt like that was because of the pun she took on her face. You should have seen it. Oh, it was crazy. All the guys just jumped at the chance to beat the hell out of that guy. If I wasn't there, he probably would have been freaking killed. Floyd said, sipping his coffee. Jesus Christ, kid. Who the hell are you lying to? I've been in this line of work long before you were at... Yeah, okay. Spare me that old man. Someone did definitely punch him hard. Sure, kid. Quiet night, isn't it? Do you ever wonder how meaningful life can be? You truly appreciate it in slow moments like these. <laughs> Maybe at your age I will. Right now, I don't give much of a shit about anything, to be honest. So, you know, so just spare me all that enlightenment artsy crap. There was an awkward silence. It made Floyd feel a little guilty. Oh, man. Sorry if I came out as rude. That's all right, kid. Oh, fuck you. The officers shared a hearty chuckle as the night went on, and they continued sipping their drinks. Steve slammed his fists on the steering wheel as he kept going. All oh, those memories hurt to remember. The dinner, he recalled, didn't happen at all. Janie claimed to have a headache and lay in bed all night, just scrolling through her phone. After dumping the bouquet of yellow and red flowers, God knows what kind they were, he'd merely mentioned yellow and red to the lady at the shop. He walked to the pub and called Janie to let her know he'd be out all night. He decided to drink himself to sleep that night didn't know where he would end up, but at this point he would gladly go to bed on a train track with a billion little spiders crawling underneath him, then go home and sleep. There was also that. Janie didn't even sleep in the same bed anymore. She would much rather prefer the couch or go work an extra shift than lay next to him. She also started to lock the doors when she changed or had a shower, which was just a minor inconvenience as compared to everything else at this point. That night he stumbled to his friend's place, drunk and stumbling. Glenn was single, and he was the last person who would comfort him, but he was the only friend he had who would let him stay. Divorce her. That's all the advice he ever got. But how could he? He still loved her. Oh, fuck this. Fuck all this. Steve let out a loud yell. Oh, fuck you. Fuck all of you. He then desperately reached for the radio, which he turned up a little louder. And now we will present you with some of the most romantic... He switched the channel. That was the last thing he wanted to hear. The mixed feelings he had for her already plagued him as it is. He didn't want to listen to the news either, so he kept changing the channel until he heard the sound of a man laughing through the radio. The laugh was wild, and it echoed and sounded as if it was two laughs coming out at once. It was a deeper voice with an audible rasp, and it felt strangely terrifying as well as soothing at the same time. The mixture of emotions he felt now annoyed him, and he spoke out softly. Go ahead, laugh at me. Go on, keep at it, he said to the voice on the radio. 
The laugh went on for another second, then abruptly paused. This was a weird coincidence, nothing more. Oh, Steve, but it is hilarious, isn't it? How everything turned out to be? The voice on the radio said back. Steve was so shocked, he stopped his car abruptly and his tires skidded a little causing the car behind him to drift sideways and almost off the road. Steve heard nothing for a moment, but then, while the man from the other car stopped and struggled to move out of his seatbelt, the voice spoke again. Drive! Drive! The voice began to ring over and over, like a corrupted radio. As the man reached Steve's window, Steve sped off in a hurry. There wasn't even a glance in the man's direction, which offended him a little. In his rage, he got his phone out, and while he thanked God for being unharmed, with shaky fingers, he dialed the police. 23152. A possible drunk driving in progress. Any units in that area, please copy. This is Officer Burke. I copy. The transmission had left Burke excited. It always did. It seemed like another chance to teach his junior something. Like a father and son at work in the garage. Okay, kid. You ready for some action? Hell yeah, man. Floyd replied, a hint of sarcasm looming in his tone. But Burke didn't mind. Their car moved out of the gas station. Bert turned on the sirens as Floyd started to drive. Hey, hey, say something. The voice on the radio had gone silent for a moment, leaving Steve all alone in that dreaded silence. Steve was about to turn the radio off when the man spoke out again. Oh, Steve, such an impatient man, aren't you? Do you think that's why Janie cheated on you? Fuck you. You hear me? Fuck you. You're not even real. I'm going crazy. I'm losing my mind, and that's it. Even though he begged for a response, he was regretting it now. These words were digging deep into his sanity and clawing at it. I'm not real. Oh, you're smarter than that. You know I'm real. Oh, I'm more real than that kiss your wife shared with. What's his name again? Oh, yes. Benjamin, was it? There was so much pleasure in his voice. It was sickening. Steve had more anger in him than fear at this point. What are you going to do, Steve? I love you, Steve. You are the only man who understands me. The voice had mimicked Janie so well. For a moment there, Steve thought she'd spoken them herself. Please, stop. Steve could only muster a whimper. May, may, maybe you still care. Am I wrong? I do. I do love her. I love her so, so much. And what is it you want most right now? The sounds of police sirens interrupted the little moment of silence in the car. And Steve stepped on the gas. You know you'll always suffer, Steve. Pain will follow you like a shadow. Oh, fuck me, Benjamin. Oh, yeah. Do it right, Doc. It mimicked her voice again. It was so perfect and so lifelike, it made Steve's gut turn. This made Steve snap. He abruptly turned his car around and drove off the road and into the dirt beside it. His car almost tipped over the side, and lucky for him it didn't. There was damage from the sudden jump and Steve knew he'd hurt his back. However, his rage masked the pain and he didn't care. Oh, fuck you. That was so long ago. She never had an affair with him, not while we were married. Stop messing around with my head. Whatever you are. Steve was fuming with rage now. He wanted to smash the radio to pieces. But he restrained himself. 
he wanted to hear. Oh, how she left him in favour of a young man with a more promising career. Broke her heart the same way as yours is right now. Steve felt anger replaced with fear. There was now a slow realisation that he didn't fully accept the truth, choosing instead to remain in denial. What do you mean? He said, stuttering, like the same way he did when he was a scared little schoolboy. Oh, you see, my dear friend, memory is the worst torture device. It can drive a person mad. All they need is someone to give it to them. <laughs> the voice began to chuckle a little, then burst out into a full laugh. It laughed louder and louder. Oh, you son of a bitch. Steve walked out of the car and opened its trunk. He picked up the shovel he'd stored in there and the gun he'd also brought along. He began his walk back, but was interrupted. Sir, put your weapons down. State police, Floyd said loudly in an attempt to impress his superior and turned back to Burke and winked. Sir, are you okay? Steve ignored it and walked away from the car and dug his shovel in the ground and started to dig. I'm sorry, Janie. I'm so, so sorry. I'm coming. I'm coming to be with you. The laughter in the radio continued. Steve didn't care anymore. He just kept digging. What the fuck is wrong with this guy, huh? Floyd asked Burke. Let me talk to him. Stay back. I got this, Floyd said in his cockiness, walking down towards Steve, who kept digging, and then walking back towards the car. His eyes focused on the ground his lips moving while he murmured to himself. Floyd pointed his gun at Steve. Get on the fucking ground. Steve then reached into his jacket pocket, and this sent Floyd into a panic. He shot Steve right over the elbow, sending him down into the dirt. Burke cussed and radioed for backup. Meanwhile, Floyd went to check on the bleeding Steve, who was bleeding from the shoulder, all the while muttering the same thing over and over. I'm sorry, Janie. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm sorry, Janie. What? Floyd asked. And then for a moment, Steve looked Floyd right into his eyes and then shot him right through the pocket of his jacket, right in the head, sending him down to the ground the life moving out of him like the smoke from his open skull. Steve struggled to stand up and kept murmuring, while Burke tried to charge at him from the road, just falling down in the dirt instead. Steve just fired at Burke casually, luckily missing him completely and not killing him, like he'd intended to, but he didn't care. Steve reached for the trunk and pulled out the lifeless corpse of Janie, completely naked, wrapped in a white towel. She looked so peaceful, like an angel. He remembered the first time they'd made love. It was awkward, but magical. Ride on the hood of his car under the blanket of the stars. And funnily enough, it was a night just like this. He placed her in the hole he'd dug for her, and removed his jacket, putting it around her lifeless body, and then reaching in for a kiss. Their lips touched. Steve didn't care. He was going to be with her again. Burke pointed his gun at Steve, warning him again, but Steve instead looked at Burke, a strange, tranquil smile on his face. As he raised the gun to his head, and shot himself through the skull once. He fell down at Burke's feet instead of his back and into the hole with Janie's lifeless corpse. Burke could see the man still smiling while blood dripped down the side of his head from his temples. He was at peace as the bullet hit him and that last look 
was the only thing remaining on him now. To Burke, this just showed the man's insanity. He heard the police sirens and withdrew his gun. It would be an offence to shoot the man again, no matter how enraged he was. He was sent off in an ambulance to spend the rest of the night, and possibly a few days, in the hospital, while the other officers on the scene inspected the madness that had unfolded him. Three bodies, one confirmed murder, one possible murder, and one confirmed suicide. Their suspect carried nothing but a twenty-two pistol and a shovel, from what was gathered. The car was empty, besides a few strands of hair from what was presumed to be the body of the female victim. The radio was turned to loud, and for some reason it had rested on nothing but static. I can't remember. And the other car came out of nowhere. Connor will relay mechanically in his disassociated state, stitching together his fragmented memories for the police report after the accident. He will stare at the scene of the crash, glancing at each piece of scattered shrapnel, reflecting his own broken thoughts. The lights from the cruisers, ambulances, and nosy rubberneckers will cause his head to throb, adding to the chaos of his universe. Eventually, the shock will pass, and he will collapse to his knees on the cold pavement in agony, grief overwhelming him. One vision will burn into his psyche, silencing the growing cacophony of his own thoughts. A seemingly innocuous item, which will fester in the back of his mind until he ends his own life many years later. A bright, yellow, Bumper sticker. Earlier that evening, Connor was enjoying a late, quiet autumn drive with his wife Megan down a lonely residential road. He was, admittedly, dizzy from the night's festivities, out with their mutual friends, but he insisted he was sober enough to take the wheel. Despite his assurances, he pressed the accelerator a bit harder than usual hoping to make it home before any cops had a chance to complicate his evening. The couple sat in silence, entwining their hands between them, falling under the spell of the rhythmic strobe of passing streetlights. Megan kept her eyes trained out her window at the changing leaves, squeezing her spouse's hand intermittently. Connor ogled her with a lazy, drunk smile on his face. Turning back to the road, he snapped out of his hypnotic state and slammed on the brakes in response to the quickly approaching taillights, which threatened a meeting with the front of their own car. Jesus! Connor spat as he and his wife lurched forward. Where the hell did this joker come from? He cried aloud. He hadn't noticed any car ahead of them when he looked at the road only seconds before. A feeling of anger rose within him as his pleasant evening drive was interrupted by overcautiousness. Honey, you need to relax. You are going too fast, Megan said matter-of-factly. Yeah, well, this idiot is going slower than 30. There's nobody around. Speed up, Connor shouted, as if the newcomers could hear him. The driver ahead showed no signs of hearing his demand, and continued to cruise at a glacial pace. Connor took note of the baby on board sticker on the bumper, a bumper which had caved in, most likely from another car slamming into its slow backside. He rolled his eyes, knowing his car had the same sticker on its bumper. Earlier he protested putting it on the car he shared with his wife Megan, but she had been adamant about it. Why would you want to advertise having a kid? Especially with potential kidnappers everywhere. Connor reasoned, but Megan insisted other motorists would drive more carefully around them, knowing they had a child in the car. Connor felt the collapsed bumper of the other car as evidence to the contrary. He kept this thought to himself. 
Connor leaned on the horn and flashed his high beams. As he did so, he noticed there was a passenger in the car. The two figures faced ahead, neither turning in their seat to acknowledge the noisy car behind them. They didn't pull over to the side. Instead, they continued at their leisurely speed. Seriously? They're going to pretend we're not here? Come on. Connor honked a few more times, but there was still no reaction from the other car. He took their indifference as insolence, which ignited his anger into rage. You're getting angry for no reason, Megan said coolly. We need to let the babysitter go. I'm not paying him for an extra hour. White knuckling the steering wheel, Connor swerved to the oncoming lane, and before he could floor the accelerator, the car ahead merged into the other lane swiftly along with them. The car remained in front of Connor and his wife, blocking their advance. Seething, Connor yelled, What the fuck is this guy's problem? Oh, it's obviously some stupid kids messing with us. Let's just stay calm and not give them the satisfaction of riling us up. Forget the babysitter. We'll be home shortly. Megan soothed. Connor wasn't having it. Now he was hell-bent on either passing the pair in front of them, or cornering them and beating their asses. The liquor fueling his bravado. He maneuvered back to the right lane, but the car matched his path exactly. The ease of their maneuvers confirmed Connor's suspicions that the occupants of the car had harassed other drivers before. Wanting to get away from the nuisance, Connor tried to think of another way to bypass the other car. Unfortunately, the road on which they traveled didn't branch off anywhere to get around the offending vehicle. Their only chance was at the end of the road, where there was a red light for a T intersection. However, that light was still a few miles away and Connor's patience was wearing thin as the other car continued its deceleration. Determined to circumvent the sluggish car, Connor tried one more ploy. This time he swung to the left, cut short and swung back to the right, hoping the other car would be caught off guard. They weren't. Instead, the other car seamlessly matched Connor's position, shifting left then, abruptly changing course back to the right lane. The way the other car matched their position struck Connor as odd. He hadn't noticed it before, but there was no hesitation from the other car. No split-second pause to consider Connor's next play. Their movements weren't that of a copycat. Rather, it was like they knew what he was going to do. Connor's brief feelings of confusion were overcome by his feelings of anger, and he responded to the other car's tricks in the most childish way he knew, and quickly flipped them the middle finger. He watched the shadowy figure driving the other car do the same. Again, there was no hesitation as the other driver's hand shot up along with Connor's. Wanting to test a theory, Connor allowed his hand to linger in the air longer than necessary waiting for the unknown driver to put his hand down. But instead, it stayed hovering in the air. Connor's anger subsided a bit. In its place, a sense of unease crept in. He unfolded his fingers, twisted his hand to present an open palm to the other car, and gave a small wave. Connor, eyes widened gawked as the silhouetted hand of the other driver slowly formed an open palm, turned to face the windshield, and waved out to the empty road ahead of them. Every motion was in harmony with Connor's actions. This mild gesture sent a ripple of fear down Connor's spine. He yanked his hand back to the steering wheel and observed the other driver do the same. Did you see that? Connor flinched at the edge of panic in his voice. You've been waving at the guy you've been bitching about for the last ten minutes? Yeah, I was there for that. Sarcasm tinted her voice. No, 
There's something weird going on. He couldn't take his eyes off the mysterious figure. Oh, he's just messing with you. No, I'm not sure what's going on. But it's as if he knows what I'm going to do. I don't think we should be anywhere near this guy anymore. Connor's eyes darted around the empty road, hoping for some signs of life to provide help, or at least comfort. But it was only him, his wife, and the couple in the dented vehicle ahead of them. Megan noticed nothing, so Connor tried to push his worry aside, but he couldn't shake the feeling. They continued driving in silence. Connor's hands tightened their grip on the wheel, straining the skin along his knuckles. The tension increased with every passing minute, until the quiet was cut by the sound of Megan's phone ringing, which caused Connor to jump in his seat. Without turning, he felt her eyes on him, the same eyes she'd penetrate him with whenever he was overreacting. She reached into her bag and produced the phone. The phone pressed to her ear, and Connor gaped at the passenger of the other car, who was also putting something to their ear. He was certain now that he wasn't hallucinating everything. The anonymous pair were, somehow, mirroring Connor and his wife. Megan hung up and mentioned something about the babysitter, but Connor was too engrossed with the occupants in the other car to hear what she was saying. Fear began to sink in, thinking about whoever, or whatever, was in the other car. Both cars drove slowly for the remaining few miles of the road. A million things ran through Connor's mind. He worried that the pair in the other car were sociopaths, part of a cult, possibly gang members, and that him and his wife were involved in some unnerving gang initiation. He wanted to turn around. But that would mean driving miles back the way they came, and he was afraid the shady couple would turn to follow them, and that was worse than having them lead. Mercifully, they came around a bend which brought them to the red light at the T intersection. Both cars stopped to wait for the light to change. When the light slipped to green, nothing happened. Connor and Megan waited for the other car's turn signal, but it never came. The two shadows stared ahead at the empty intersection, idling at the light, as if to dare Connor to give way first. He gnawed on his cheek, hoping the other couple would just speed off and that whatever was going on was just some horrible, practical joke. But they didn't budge. Why aren't they moving? The light's green. Megan asked her husband, confused. A few more seconds of the standoff, and Connor steeled himself to put a stop to whatever it was the dark couple was trying to do. Connor cautiously stretched a hand into the back seat, fearing he might spook the shadow couple if he moved too quickly, and snatched the ice scraper from the floor. It was a poor excuse for a weapon, but he needed a defense in case the other couple was dangerous, and with every second that passed, Connor became more convinced that they were. Mex, I need you to stay in the car. Make sure you have 911 dialed on your phone, and get into the driver's seat. In case something goes wrong, I want you to be out of here and calling them. Connor implored. Connor, you're overreacting. She tried to calm him down, but she was visibly nervous. Maybe so, but still, get into the driver's seat and put the car in reverse so you're ready to take off. She recognized the seriousness in his face and nodded. Connor took a deep breath to prepare for whatever he was going to face and opened the car door. He was surprised that nothing stirred within the other car. He stepped out into the cool night air, and his wife slid into his seat. She closed the door behind him and locked it. Warily, Connor shuffled toward the driver's side of the sinister car and raised the ice scraper, clutching it tightly in both hands. 
his heart knocked against his ribcage. He caught an incomplete view of the front of their car, but noted that it was similarly devastated as the back of the vehicle. He licked his lips, attempting to get strength into his voice, and barked to the occupants in the dented car. I'm not sure what your problem is, but get the hell away from... Suddenly, the car accelerated and shot across the intersection. Instead of turning, it ploughed through the guardrail along the intersection. The sound of screeching metal on metal punctured through the night, and Connor watched the savage bumper and comical sticker of the other car disappear and plummet 100 feet into the vegetation below. Dumbfounded, Connor froze in mid-step. A few seconds of his wife shrieking finally coaxed him back from his shock. Megs, call the police right now. Tell them someone drove off the road and may need help. He whipped his head to see her nod in compliance, but she was shaking terribly. The ice scraper lowered and Connor ambled across the intersection. He loitered near the part of the barrier still intact. He hesitated before inspecting the scene, not wanting to see body parts or any mess that was down there. He breathed deep and peered over the cliff. There was nothing. Connor's eyebrows furrowed in confusion. He squinted harder to scrutinize the dark underbrush, but he could discern nothing. There was no glow from the taillights. No glint of moonlight on the car's surface, and no sound of a constant blaring horn. The barrier was torn through, evidence that an object had crashed through it. But that object had somehow disappeared. Without glancing back, Connor called over his shoulder. Megs, the car is gone. What? She shouted back. There's no car. Connor spun around in time to witness an enormous semi-truck slam into the back of their car. Like a rocket, their little sedan, with his wife inside, bolted across the road. The gust of wind created by the car's speed was enough to blow him back and steal the air from his lungs. His eyes met his wife's terrified gaze for a heartbeat her glossy green eyes wide and fearful. Then, she disappeared over the edge. A moment of disbelief passed. Then Connor roared Megan's name. He stalled, reluctant to look over the edge again. He had a small glimmer of hope that once again nothing would be at the bottom of the cliff. He agonizingly dragged his gaze back to the depths and this time the car lay there in ruin a crushed metallic heap at the bottom of the dark pit before he fell into shock unable to think coherently before the police arrived too late to save his wife Connor noticed one thing the unmistakable baby on board sticker which clung to the remnants of the collapsed bumper on the back of their car it was unsettling to him how familiar that bumper seemed So a couple of road-based uh, stories for you there. Always a very evocative theme, uh, very fertile ground to search around for a good story. Did you like those? I did. Well, I always say that, don't I? <laughs> I only read stuff that I personally enjoy, even if um, it's not quite a fully formed story. If I think there's something there, a little kernel of interest, intrigue, or I think the writer is on the right lines and they could have a promising future, then I read it. And I really like those too. Very creepy. Always very creepy place, isn't it? The open road. Well, my dear friends, that is it for another night. Will I be back again soon? Of course I will.
Until then, very, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?